Hey, this is Matt Williams and I'm here today with Scott Kaplan, uh, my long-term great friend uh, and also the founder of In Life Wellness. So this is a, a wellness studio concept that you're gonna wanna um, take notes and learn a lot about. Uh, today we talk about fitness, franchising and business in general, pitfalls, um, all the trials and tribulations involved in starting your own business and the benefits of owning an In Life Wellness studio. Okay, good. Um, Scott, it's great to have you here. Thanks, mate. Thanks so we're here to talk about uh, a new concept in wellness, um, in life wellness. Uh, so let's get underway. Firstly, before we um, ask you a bunch of questions about the business and, and opportunity, um, how long have you actually been in the fitness industry? I started as a personal trainer in 1999, so it must be 23 years now. Yeah. Um, it's been a interesting journey got the funny journey not really funny probably pretty pretty normal or not uncommon at least you know finished high school university business degree corporate world it took about three years but realistically three months to realize it wasn't for me <laughs> and um yeah did my personal training qualifications when i was 23 yeah and uh just never looked back you know worked in the gym closer to home this is the story I, I tell, you know, out of the suit and tie into the shorts and shirt, did a lot of uh, work I felt much more congruent with. Yeah. Big hours, I'm really lucky to have awesome mentors in the yeah. early stage of working with a great bunch of guys and girls and yeah, we, we worked hard, we learned a lot and back then personal training was probably still relatively burgeoning in Australia and, yeah. uh, and the fitness industry has changed a, a fair bit and, you know, I've tried my best to change along with it. Yeah, good. That's a good point. So over the years that you've been in, uh, and that is that is some time in the industry, you would have seen a lot of changes. So tell us about some of those changes. And I know that um, we'll talk about the difference as well between fitness and wellness and what you've seen evolve over the last couple of decades. Yeah, a few questions in one there, I suppose. Um, you know, I've known you for a long time. And when we were going to the, the gym back in the 90s, there was around about 600 gyms in Australia. There's closer to 3,000 now, but that includes studios and mm. Back in the in the day, there was what they called the big box gyms. They're two thousand square meters, like your, your fitness first. Yeah. And um, I think they provide really amazing value. They've got all the equipment you can need. They've got the showers, the change rooms, the car parking, the child minding mm. at, at a pretty affordable price. Now the big boxes, um, they lost a lot of market share. You know, to the the budgets. You most notably anytime fitness, and then you've got your plus and your jets and your and your snap. Um, where people realised, oh, maybe I could probably get the same sort of um, workout or service, which is minimal, mm -hmm. um, for, for half the price. Um, and then after the, the budgets became the boutiques. Um, yes. And that's kind of where we are now. And the boutiques have probably got a good a good 10 or 15 years in them, you know, we, yeah. we hope. And who knows what will come next. Everyone in fitness wishes they had the crystal ball. So that's mm -hmm. probably the big thing, the big box to the budget to the boutique. Yeah. Um, I think the last 15 years, 20 years, the, the high impact, high intensity movements mm. had a good run. Yes. Um, so the BF45s of the world. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and they're amazing. I mean, what a, what a concept, you know, a couple of thousand franchises around the world, you know, and, and nothing's bad. There's just a time and a place and there's a preference. Yeah. You know, some people just like to, to do burpees and work really hard and yeah. you know, some people like to do yoga and some people like to swim laps at the pool and some people like to run up and down sand hills. So it's whatever you're into really. But... You know, boot camp F45, um, you know, CrossFit, like CrossFit's an amazing concept where, you know, they've created a community and every, in every CrossFit studio in the world, everyone does the same workout, you know. Like, yes. How, how interesting, you know. Yeah. But, um, uh, you know, I think not many people are looking after, especially ladies in the 40 to 70 year old mm -hmm. age group. I think after a couple of decades of high impact movement, some people have, have had enough. We get a lot of people at In Life Wellness who are coming from Fitness First CrossFit. Yeah. And we all see a lot of people who have done nothing for 20 years. Yeah, yeah. And, and they, for, for one reason or another, they, they seem to think that Pilates, Reformer Pilates in particular, is good for them, which is interesting because 95% of people that come to us have not done Reformer Pilates. Mm. But for one reason or another, they perceive it as something that anyone can do. Yes. Um, I think that's, I, I want to just um, come back to a couple of points that you made. Firstly, like those big box fitness centres, um, and, and you're right, there, there is nothing, there's, there's no bad out there. One of the things that used to bother me, which I think we've seen that transition from um, to, towards boutique um, uh, service-driven environments where the owners, franchisees, whatever, really care about their clients' results and know any for everyone by name, um, 
I know that you and I had an experience walking into fitness first many years ago and the person behind the counter was studying for some upcoming university exam mm -hmm. and they didn't leave and lift their head to look at us. They just took our card, swiped it and, uh, and then let it through. Mm -hmm. And I think about the, the big guys, they kind of counted on the fact that maybe 80% of people wouldn't show up. These small boutique operations where the owners really care about every individual, individual person and their results. Firstly, I like the fact that the fitness industry is going in that direction. And I know that that's a big thing for you with your focus at In Life. Well, that's a, a huge a huge thing. See, I've owned 11 health clubs and yeah. In Life is the only time I've never had membership contracts. Ironically, it's the best member retention we've ever had. Yeah, wow. So in Australia and USA, last 30 years, average member retention is one year. Yeah. And average attendance is 1.2 visits per member per week. Yeah. If that makes sense. So we're sitting at 4.8 visits per week per member. That's amazing. And an average retention of 2.2 years as opposed to one. And you've got to ask yourself, why is it one year retention? It's because most people have one year contracts. Yeah. And so, you know, we get people saying, oh, there's no mystery, is there? There's no mystery. But yeah. so how much of that year are people engaged? And mm. we hear the stories. I was a member of so-and-so for 18 months. I went twice. And the thing is, yeah. with no contracts and with a price point of 59 bucks a week, people don't not come. Yeah. Because if you don't not come, if you don't come for a week or two weeks, they just cancel. So it's yeah. the responsibility is on us to do great work to create a engaged, community yeah. to make them want to come to keep them engaged. Yeah. And and another point, when you talk about the the F forty fives and the boot camps, um, classic example is my sister in her late forties, and she um, got on the F forty five bandwagon. And again, nothing wrong with it. Great. Um, it's fantastic what they what they've done. But she got on that train and then got off. And one of the reasons is because she's just getting flogged at every session. Mm. So from from the outside looking in and having experience in the industry, I could see that it wasn't probably sustainable for my sister. Um, but I see in life, especially in that group of um, more mature um, women in particular, but um, they need something that's sustainable that they can continue to do. And that's mm. going to probably contribute to the longevity of the membership as well. I think so. It's a beautiful way to exercise. But Reformer Pilates is not all we do. We have other classes. Yeah. It's a complete solution. We yeah. have strength-based classes, um, interval fitness-based hip classes. Mm -hmm. We have all sorts of variety with fitball classes. We fuse Reformer Pilates with other methodologies, other modes of exercise. So there's a heap of variety on the timetable which contributes to our member retention. Yeah. And, um, you know, like... People, some people just don't want to be flogged. Some yeah. people do, yeah, and that's yeah. fine. Um, but uh, a, a lot of people, a lot of people, they don't. H half our members are people who cannot not exercise. You know, yeah. the exercise is part of who they are. And yes. the other half of people, probably like a lot of gyms, it doesn't come naturally to them, but they know that they should do it. Yeah, and they want to do it. it it's probably always going to be an effort. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and we make both groups of people feel equally comfortable. But that latter group, the people who it doesn't come naturally to them, they're the ones that you've got to you know, really make make it so that it's a place they, they want to come. And there's a number of ways to do that. Um, you touched on knowing people's names earlier. That's, that's a big one. Mm -hmm. We know their name, they know our names. But the, the, the holy grail of community is when the members know each other's names. Yeah. And they end up staying I love that. seriously for each other. So, yeah. you know, like, hey, Jane, have you met Sarah? Boom. Um, yeah. yeah. Inevitably, people come to do the same class at the same time and the same day and they see the same people. And yeah. Yeah, that's a community. Christmas party and, you yeah. know, the, the rest is history. Three years later, they're, they're yeah. still there. Fantastic. So anyone watching this, let's say someone's thinking about they want to open their own studio. Yeah. Um, now, just quickly on that. So let's make that distinction between studio and or gym and or fitness facility. Um, I know there's crossover, but we refer to um, and in life as a studio. Um, why exactly? So a gym, um, like we mentioned earlier, a uh, large facility, lots of equipment. Yep. You pay a membership fee, you have a membership card or key in it, you're off, off, off to do your own. You're on your own, yeah. I was going to say, you know, good luck or do your own devices. But you know what, like, I don't know about you, I, I, I like that. I yeah. don't want someone to talk to me at the gym yeah. when I go to do my own stuff. Yeah. I have a gym membership elsewhere because I can't train in my own place because yeah. people want to talk to me or I start looking around thinking about walls I should be painting and stuff yeah. like that. Um, a studio, uh, a boutique environment, something yeah. like 100 to 200 members okay, great. where we do know everybody's name. Yeah. Higher price point, much higher level of customer service. Studio is normally synonymous with either group exercise classes or personal training, mm -hmm. not a do-it-yourself gym style membership where you go and have your own workout. Yeah. So we're a group exercise business. We have um, about 68 classes per week. People come and they do a class and they leave. People, I mean, there's a lot of, I mentioned the crystal ball earlier, but there's a big, um, what's the word? The, the largest fitness industry convention in the world is is by a, a company called 
Ursa by HRSA and they have a convention every year and they do surveys and one of the big survey findings was that 90% of people want to train in a group. You know, a lot of people don't know what to do at the gym. A lot of people don't want to think at the gym. They come, they're guaranteed to have an effective guided exercise experience and that, that goes fast yeah. and, and they leave. And that's an interesting point too. We don't just take them for a workout. We try and create an experience mm. through things like music and lighting and candles and incense. You know? Love it. Yeah. yeah. And you mentioned community a few times. Interesting point. I didn't realise this, but you said that the membership base might sit between 100 and 200. Um, there's some interesting data in business um, on that magical 150 number. So um, how many people can we... Sure, there's people with Facebook friends in the thousands, but how many people can we really connect to? Mm. And 150 seems to to be that sweet spot it's interesting that you've selected that as a sweet spot for in life as well mm. um where 150 seems to be you can build a community at that that amount it's not unrealistic to know 150 names yeah and 150 members kids names and dogs names yeah 150 members injuries if they've got them yeah when they walk in point. they're doing an exercise it's how's your knee what's your back on this one jane that yeah sort wow of thing. so and, 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 and like i have my studio it's got 270 members and it really does get beyond that point yes and then you'll let every now and then you get a cancellation and you'll say oh, who, who, who's that I yeah. don't recall that person so that that's not good 150 also ties into you know do the maths 150 people coming four times a week you need 600 class spots a week you know mm -hmm. yeah. if there's 15 spots in a class how many classes do you need Great. and then what size facility do you need and what do the wages add up to? You know, it's all about yeah. the model. Yeah. And when someone says I've got a proven model with systems that have been developed over the last 12 years, it's not a throwaway line. It is yeah. a system. It's that, that trial and error and mistakes and lost time and lost money. Yeah to get to this point where you can say, bang, this is replicable. You know, I never wanted to be, I never thought I'd want to be a franchise or, you know, mm. like, you know, there's a couple of experiences you might have heard of or, you know, but you know, as a as a person who loves mentoring and, and coaching, and and um, and I'm really passionate about helping people have their own business because business ownership's been so great for me. I think it's a, yeah. the ultimate personal and professional growth experience. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and you know, like I love that saying, you know, follow your heart, but take your brains with you. And mm -hmm. I, I do think, you know, I started my career in 2000. And five as a franchisee you know mm -hmm. being a multiple franchisee as you know and yes. and, and you own five gloria jeans so you understand franchising yep. as well and you understand fitness and you understand business so mm -hmm. you know it was the best way for me to start and, and in many ways like i i missed the network and you know yeah. the, the meetings and the friendships and the and the bouncing stuff off other people and you know they've been like the, the friendly rivalry and all sorts of things mm -hmm. you know so um, it's a real team environment. Well, you know, you and and I, I, I found that as well, that in all of my franchisee experience, uh, it was collaborating with the other franchisees um, that made all the difference. Even even to this day, um, our current business, when we get together for the international conferences, it's the other distributors um, from around the world that we seem to learn the most from. Now, you meant, um, made a point that it wasn't your intention to set out to create a franchise model, but I know that the right intention with any business, no matter how big or small it is, you want to approach it, even if you're only going to have one location, you want to approach it as though you want a thousand locations. Mm -hmm. And that's the mindset that you brought to this. You, you've you touched on systems. It's it's critical that a for a business to survive, it's got to have systems. And I'll, I'll say, I'll put it this way, not just survive, but not need to rely on the owner being in it mm -hmm. day in and day mm -hmm. out. So talk, talk to that. Well, okay, the people watching systems you know i mean do they know what a system is and it's, yeah. a, it's a proven way of doing things it's a it, a system makes a good person great and a mm. system makes a business run without you i mean something that motivates me in business now and also when i was a franchise owner is a you know enjoying my work b making a, a, a great income healthy profits b building up an asset that is you know sellable yes. really yes um that's really cool you know you can't sell your job if you don't like it but if you sort of you can build up a business and, and, and sell it or you can build it up to run without you which is one of the other seven habits begin with end in mind or one yeah. we touched on earlier yeah. but um yeah so yeah, systems i mean i say that without systems or if you are a sole trader like joe the mechanic who yeah. at the you know the mechanic shop yeah working on cars all day he doesn't have a business mm -hmm. he's got a job where he's got to pay rent and have all the headaches of a business owner, like recruitment and marketing and, and, and tax and legal. So if it, the business doesn't work without you, you don't have a business. That's I think, I think that's that's the key. Um, the 
the great book on small business, The E-Myth by Michael Gerber, he makes a comment, um, <clears throat> Does the, do you work harder for the business or does the business work harder for mm-hmm. you? And I love that line. And the case in point, there's a butcher down the road from my home. Uh, he's been operating for 50 years and is about to close his doors because he was unable to actually sell the business mm-hmm. um, it, despite him wanting to because it was all about him mm-hmm. uh, for, for that many years. But when you've got a business that is built on systems um, mm-hmm. like this, like you say, you've got something that is saleable down the track that doesn't necessarily rely on the owner of the business to be in there day in and day out, which is which is crucial. So let's say someone's watching this and they're thinking, wow, that's so inspiring. I love the idea of building a community around wellness. I love the idea of connecting with my members and my team. And this sounds fantastic. What What's involved in uh, and what are you looking for? I've probably got a few answers in my head. And I'd like to start with just talking about how the business model evolved and you know, I, I owned a number of personal training studios, which are mm-hmm. really labor intensive. And then I owned a, a couple of like large to medium to large health clubs where they were commercial gyms with, you know, 1500 members mm-hmm. and 70 group exercise classes mm-hmm. and doing a few hundred PT sessions a week. It's yes. so, like they're monsters to run, but we've got this business model now where it, it, it's just really easy to run, Yeah, you know, and, and in, in the best possible way, you know, like those businesses that we used to work with all, all the um all the all the top franchise owners were alpha males you know mm-hmm. but, but here it's more like leadership it's about it's about detail and managing the timetable and customer service and and meeting and greeting you, mm-hmm. you don't need to be like a really strong leader if anything you know i own a studio now that's under management and it's almost like the manager's role is um you know it's you know you know not to not not to downplay it, but it's it's a lot of admin and it's a yeah. lot of customer service. Mm-hmm. And um, I've got a wonderful manager, you know, really grateful to her, and and uh, and she's enjoying it, you know. And I, I probably lo- love those jobs as well. Yeah. But um, you know, what's involved in someone who wanted to op- wanting to open a, a, a franchise? Like, why is F forty five done so well? I mean, you know, probably a number of reasons. And you know, I suppose for the entry point, a lot of people who are in the fitness industry thought, wow, you know, I can, that's accessible. I can mm-hmm. do it and I can, I can make a real go of it. And so I want to do that for, for people and probably in particular Pilates instructors, you know, yes. the amount of people who have thought about opening their own business for a number of years. Like they I don't know where to start. Don't know where to start yeah. or it's a big step, you know, it's a big it's step. Huge. It's a huge step, you know, and, and, I really want to minimize the risk for people and maximize the upside. And I've, I've made a lot of mistakes, you know, like in, um, I've had a lot of success, but some of the mistakes I've made, like that's really where you learn the most, you yeah. know, and I don't want to do that again myself and I don't want that for anyone either. Mm. And I think it's really achievable. Like, so, you know, when you like say what's involved, I mean, there's a, there's a whole bunch of steps, but if someone's thinking about it, they'd inquire, you know, mm. with franchising, it's heavily regulated sector, which is designed to protect both parties. Sometimes yes. I think it's mostly designed to protect the franchise owner. If you yeah. can think of anything that's gone wrong in franchising in the last 50 years, mm. the franchising code of conduct, the disclosure document, the franchise agreement, it just covers all of it yeah. to the point where, you know, if you're excited about opening a franchise, just read the agreement and you'll get really not excited. <laughs> so, um, but you know, it's, it's gotta be done. So someone would inquire and then, you know, we have, information documents, a, a very high level overview prospectus. We ask someone to complete an expression of interest. We ask someone to sign an NDA and then we can send more detailed information. We send the franchising code of conduct and the franchising information statement from the ACCC. And it, it, it's just to make sure that we do everything properly and people have all the information that they need to make a decision. Then we have meetings or phone discussions and I can show them. In franchising, you've got to be really careful about telling people how much money they can make. Yes. But what I can show them is what the current studios are making. Yeah, yeah. Um, because I own some of those, and with the permission of the other franchise owners, I can show them that too. Yeah. So you can't get in trouble for showing actuals. Yeah. But um, I know that, you know, if we have 150 members at $59 a week, that's about seven and a half grand in revenue. On top of that, we also sell class packages and we also charge people to do a one week trial, which is our main marketing vehicle. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if the income of a studio is seven, eight grand a week, we look for those 150 square meter spaces mm-hmm. where the rent's 50 grand a year. So, you know, seven and a half grand a week each, I should take off the GST, call the, call the income, you know, 6,800 bucks, call it seven grand. The rent it's one grand. You know, the wages at most would be two grand. You know, mm. What's left over? There's not many expenses. Yeah. Bit of internet, bit of phone, bit of consumables, your antibacterial wipes and some yeah. toilet paper and yeah. just some silly stuff. You know, if you want to do some marketing, that's up to you. It's encouraged, but it's not compulsory really. Yeah. And what I love about it as well is the accessibility you talked about 
making it accessible. But to get in is not um, an exorbitant amount of money. I mean, if you go to the extreme, like you need $5 million to open a McDonald's. Um, But even back in my day, opening Gloria Jean's coffee um, shops, uh, that was half a million bucks a pop. But this is a lot less and a lot more accessible. Some people might look at the entry point and go, oh, is this for real? Because it is so low. Yeah, yeah, well, you can break it down and that's what somebody receives pretty quickly in the negotiation piece, the initial capital outlay or the opening investment summary. Yeah. Um, the 100 grand, you know, we get the equipment um, wholesale price, which I just pass on. Yeah, right. Um, and there's, a, there's an upfront franchise fee of 20 grand and a training fee of 10 grand. Then with the equipment, by the way, the, the main expense is the reform of parties machines. Mm-hmm. And that's included in the 100, but it's financeable. So when you start right. looking at the amount of cash you need up front, which includes a rental bond of 15 yes. grand, yeah. which you can secure against an asset or get a bank guarantee. Mm-hmm. So some people are doing it with 50 to 60 to 70 grand you know, Amazing. of liquid capital. And some people are doing it without getting any finance at all, which you know there's different schools of thought on finance, but mm-hmm. uh, you know, if you don't need to borrow loads of money, then some people see that as a good thing. Yeah, if you run the numbers on getting in with that and then the types of returns that, you know, just even the numbers that you just disclosed, um, it's an exciting opportunity. Yeah, well, I think about return on investment. You know, if you put in 100 grand, you know, what do you get annually? What can it keep giving you? What sort of asset can you build up to be worth a certain amount of money? But I would encourage anyone to look at other franchise systems mm-hmm. or brands in this market and find out what they cost to open. Yeah, great. Um, so the, on that, the brand, let's talk about in life and, and wellness in that, in that category and let's talk about some of the other brands mm. out there. Um, what does differentiate in life from others? Well, firstly, there's, I call it the offering, like what we offer. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people will go to a, a gym or do their 45 and they'll, they'll join a Pilates studio and buy a class package because they want to do their Pilates, but the Pilates studio doesn't do everything they want it to do. So they've got to be a member of one or two other facilities. Yeah. But we're a complete solution yes. where we do have all those things I mentioned earlier. There's a class called Streamline, probably our most popular class where it's a class that uses light weights and bands and all sorts of other tools. We call them props, basically bits of equipment where people, in particular ladies, can have a really great resistance training style workout. So, you know, you probably know, but from your experience with exercise, it's kind of like, oh, what's the best thing I can do to get a good body? And sometimes the best exercise plans are the ones that actually happen because they're things that you enjoy yes. and they're done at times you yep. like. And I really believe that. I also believe that if you get your nutrition right, you can do what you like for exercise. But my only little caveat is that there's got to be some sort of resistance training involved. Now, yeah. Reformer Pilates is a form of resistance training. Mm-hmm. So is streamlined. And then we've got these other classes, class called intervals, which like the name suggests is short bursts of high intensity intervals. The studio, for the most part, is a a low-impact zone or an impact-free zone. Mm -hmm. It's just a couple of exercises and a little bit jumpy-jumpy that get the heart rate up. But then there's a lot of novelty classes like fitball classes, classes where we use the foam roller not for rehabilitation but as a prop to do things like hip thrusts and chest presses and all sorts of things. So, I mean, the people that are watching this might be considering opening a studio, but my school of thought is how many classes can I make? How much variety can I have with equipment that costs not much? You know, because... Oh, I opened a gym once. We spent 500 grand on treadmills. You know, seriously, that was the one piece of equipment. Or the chest press where you put the pin in and you push with it. Just like they're 6,000 bucks. Yeah. But, you know, for that, we could buy five reformer Pilates machines for that. So mm-hmm. it's just, um, if, yeah, sometimes I think you've got to make a few mistakes to get, or maybe it's just maturity. Maybe it's, I don't know, just coming to this place where. I just want to make it as low cost as I can. We're not cutting corners though. Yeah, yeah. And I think that that's, it's a good point that um, that anyone getting involved in in life uh, from, from a franchisee perspective, uh, they get to piggyback on those errors that you've made because the worst thing in business is going through trial and error and, and, oh, and starting from scratch. Yeah, yeah. That's um, what you say, like but if you make mistakes so you yeah, don't have to. But Exactly. Remember we used to say that a lot of franchisors think the customer is the end user, Mm, like the member, mm -hmm. where I think the most important person in my world is the studio owner. Fantastic. And, um, you know, if they're happy, I just think win-win, like that's just a philosophy on life. If they they do well, I want to do well. If they they do well, see, you know the other saying about like plans are 
you know, plans of those things that you make while, while wife's happening or, mm-hmm. you know, don't get too attached to them. But like, yeah, do I, are we going to have 10 of these studios or 30 or 200? Like, I don't know. I just want everyone that's got one to do really well. Yeah. Okay. That's a great point because we have had that conversation and made that distinction comparing varying franchises in and out of the fitness industry. And and I think it's it's a lesson that I learned very early on that, um, that yeah, who is the end consumer? So the end consumer for the, for the franchise operator is the member. But for you in your mind the end user like your your customer is a franchisee Mm -hmm. um and it's important that they're make they're reaching their goals whether it be financial or just life fulfillment of owning their own business um that's a great key because i I see franchises breaking down when they forget who their customer is where they don't realize that the franchisee is their customer and therefore they look at well there's the profitability of myself um and i've got to make sure that i'm paying attention to the end consumer you seem to have that piece right even when before you talked about passing on that wholesale discount to the to the client you want them up and running low cost you want them operating and profitable really quickly really quickly yeah i mean on that note you know before a studio opens we do a pre-opening marketing campaign Mm -hmm. and it's just six weeks before we open quite simply we do a lot of facebook ads in the area any other connections that you have with local business owners or people that can promote it for you, um, social media, marketing, we do we do a lot of that. But the idea is that you'll open with 50 to 100 trial members. Mm-hmm. So that means before on, on day one, there's, 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 say for example, we opened a studio in Ingardine, there was just 72, not, not heaps, 72 yeah. members who had purchased a one-week trial. Mm-hmm. Um, um, so by week two, they'd all completed their trial. We'd signed up 49 of those. Fantastic. 49 times 60, so income about two and a half grand a week. Rent paid for, wages paid for, yeah. break even. So already a break even by week two. What I also love, you said that they paid for their trial. And you mentioned that earlier as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's key because if your marketing activities um, aren't costing you a lot of money, then you can continue to ramp them up until you get yeah, yeah, the... Yeah, we sort of get somewhere between seven to, to 20 trial members a week. You know? So if you... If you 500 a year and you do the maths on the conversion you know you can and this is another good point that i'm about to get to you just maybe think of it it's not about sales in our industry it's about mm. retention yeah you, know, you don't want to have one in one out one in one out one in two out we, yeah. we just want to keep keep them in keep them in that's why you look after the current people and then what, what do they do they go and tell everyone exactly, exactly. so exactly. you don't exactly. need to spend up anything on market right there that's that's a key to business right there and i, I say it all the time is imagine how big your business would be if you'd never lost a customer yeah. and 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 sometimes it's horrifying because you think oh my gosh it'd be, it'd be huge yeah. but you've also put the your attention on that. So the systems are designed around retention, not having to keep on filling that funnel on the front end because you're losing them on the back end. We don't need hardcore salespeople. Yeah. It's not about sales. Remember back in the 80s, like those movies like Wall Street and Boiler Room where yeah. it was about the big clothes? Yeah. The big clothes, like I yeah. tell a story and then give a pitch and do a close. Now it's, it's a really real relationship-based sale. Someone... Yeah registers on our website for a trial and the name comes through. We've done four trials this morning at Menai, so it's really good. Um, we call them, we book in. The first thing we do, which no studios do, is a one-on-one intro session. Like mm-hmm. imagine your wife came to do Pilates and she never done it before. The worst thing that she could do is jump into a class with 14 people and not understand the terminology. People get to the class two minutes before the class starts. Mm-hmm. Oh my God, what do I do? Where do I park? Where do I put my keys and shoes? I've got yeah. my shoes on, you don't wear yeah. shoes. Uh, you know, so we do this one-on-one where it's no one in the studio, nice and quiet. We take them through 30, 40 minutes of performing Pilates. We Amazing. understand their goals, talk about their injury, show them where the bathroom is, show them how to check in when they arrive, make sure they know how to use our app. And then they come and do their first class and then we follow up again. And they do another couple of classes through yeah. the trial and we see them in the studio and we follow, we follow up again. We don't ask them to buy anything, we just follow up. And then the trial comes to an end and we say, have you given any thought to what you want to do moving forward? And they say, I'll sign up. Because because they purchased the trial, their credit card details are in a secure system. Yeah. We click a couple of buttons at our end and they're, and they're on board. Yeah, I love that. A couple of things. One is I remember uh, the old Fitness First days where you'd get a couple of young fit people at a shopping center almost jumping out in front of you to get you a flyer and sign you up and and, and that was that was difficult hard selling um, which people don't want to do these days what I also loved about what you just said because and I was going to ask you this question um, 
I heard this quote recently and I love it. Um, people don't want more choice. They want to be confident in the choices they make mm -hmm. when it comes to marketing. And I think about those big box um, fitness centers where they were all focused on, well, firstly, let's get people through that front end. And then a few of these um, clubs were notorious for not letting people leave. <laughs> there, there was that piece. But also, what else can we offer? They were going bigger, 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 trying to offer more choice so that people didn't have to go anywhere else. But people just want to be confident in the choices they make. And it sounds like you're you've systemized it to a point so that after that initial trial or during that initial one-on-one, um, -on -one, people get really comfortable and really certain in the choice that they're about to make. Well, they do, but the final kicker is that there's no contract. Yeah. So why would they not join up? Why would they not? And the other thing is too, like I said, I've had gyms where there's contracts, but you get to five months in, the lady has a pregnancy complication. Someone moves. Like, what do you do? You let them go anyway. Of course. I mean, otherwise, because we cannot have people, you know what I can afford? I can afford to lose a member that pays 15 bucks a week. What I can't afford is to have 10 people out in the community saying yeah. that we're bad. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah. And, and that's, um, I feel like that's heart though right there is when, if someone no longer wants to Oh, I have that philosophy around here. If someone doesn't want to do business with us, then you have to let people part ways. Because you know what happens in six, eight, 18 months? They, they come back. Yeah, yeah, and that's, absolutely. That's great. Yeah, I, I love that too. It's a bit like, you know, oh gosh, I've had my girlfriend for two years. I'm going to break up. Then I go and see what's out there and I realize it's actually not that good. So then I get back with them and get married. <laughs> so is it bad? Is it bad that, that, that happened to me? <laughs> too far. <laughs> Cut. Cut. <laughs> My colour, yeah. but um, no, no, it's good because, because people say I want to join, but you know what? I've got I've got eight weeks left with so and so, yeah, or I've got four months left, and I'll come then. Mm -hmm. You know what I say? I say um, just come and join up. I'll just make it no charge for eight weeks. Yeah, and, um, and then the, and a you know what they're not going back to the other place. Yeah, and b like they you know the law law of reciprocity, like they kind of feel grateful, mm. um, which is nice. But another body in a class for a few weeks, not paying, no drama. Yeah, you know, and then they refer three people. Look, I had a question, but I think you've answered it right there, which is tell me about the culture at InLife. Yeah, well, culture is a really broad word, right? Yeah. You know, there's a, but over, the overarching culture is warm, friendly. Yeah. Um, everyone's made to feel like they've achieved something by turning up and oh, they've nice. made to feel something like they've achieved something when they leave, you know, regardless of whether they perform well or not. Mm -hmm. um, you know, knowing names, hello, goodbye, um, personal contact. Um, but there's also a culture of punctuality. There's a culture of professionalism. There's a culture of um, there's this unspoken, you know, culture of resilience. You know, we have classes every day at five thirty a.m. You know, mm. you just don't say you're tired. You just get there and, and, yeah. you, and you do it. Yeah. Um, we have a you know like a culture of community, a culture of drinking herbal tea after a class, all, all, all sorts of things. You know, just a high level of customer service. Um, you know, we 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 have a, a culture of social events and workshops and. We have a strong culture when it comes to our internal team education and training. Mm -hmm. you know, one Saturday, um, every second month, we, we do a team training session. So yeah. it sounds like a small thing, but in our industry, a lot of people do their weekend course qualification yeah. and there's no more learning. And that's it. You know, it's just you're on your own. Um, and yeah. they say watch a lot of YouTube or something. That's yeah. how they get ideas. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, that's one thing. We have a culture of, you know, teamwork. We have a culture of helping. You know, at mm -hmm. the moment, so we have a private WhatsApp group and someone's going on a holiday in May and we fill in for each other. You yeah. Because, yeah. you know, you fill in for me and then you go on a holiday, I fill in for you. It just mm. works. So One thing I love about classes is, and you talked about community and classes and people getting to, and not just you knowing the members' names, but them knowing each other's names, that um, discipline required to show up at 5.30, um, a lot of people don't, don't have that. A lot of people have to pay a lot of money for a trainer to hold them accountable. But the class environment is an accountability environment as well. Well, we want to, yeah, it was a probably a number of years ago when I was working heavily in personal training and, and I loved it. And what were the great things about PT studios? You know, we did know everybody's name. Mm -hmm. um, the results were awesome. The yeah. focus on education was great. Um, but probably the downside is that it was probably affordable for yeah. five percent of the population yeah. you know who wants to spend 100 or 250 bucks a week on personal training yeah so i thought how can we bring a lot of those benefits of pt which were accountability and education yeah. mm -hmm. to a to either a gym or a, a group exercise studio environment and you know we have our app uh, people mm -hmm. put classes on the app there's a 12-hour cancellation policy if you cancel three times in a calendar month or don't show up or if you're late, you get a strike. Three strikes are in the sin bin. You can't book for two days. But people really respect the policy. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, we get that sometimes you wake up and you've got a sick kid or, you know, there's a work emergency. So that's why you get three chances. Yeah, fantastic. Three, three chances, we say, it's probably 
It's probably you. Yeah, <laughs> so, <laughs> it's probably you. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the the type of client that, well, the the end user client, the, the member that comes to in life, and then also uh, the type of um, franchisee that you're looking for. Okay, well, the member, you know, if I was to broadly categorize our target market, it would be 35 to 65 year old females. You know, yeah. we're always saying we want to get more guys in here, I'm flogging a dead horse. We get yeah. the handful of guys, I call them the enlightened ones, the, guy who's, yeah. the guys who notice, know that core stability and flexibility is, is really good for mm-hmm. you. But, um, you know, if anytime fitness gets 80% males, we get 95% females. It's, it's fine. You know, whenever you offer a high level of service and whenever you add Pilates and yoga, you get a lot of ladies. Yes. But that's cool. I love working with ladies. Um, However, you know, we get a lot of people in their 20s as well. We get a lot of mother-daughter combinations. We get a lot of oh, sisters. We nice. get a lot of friends joining together. So there's not many things you can do, you know, with your daughter, but yeah. Pilates is one of them. Yeah. Um, the members that we have, they're looking for somewhere that they can join for one to two to five years. Mm. You know, they want a home, somewhere, something that's sustainable. Yeah. And the good thing about that age group of the target market, especially when it gets to 40 to 70. And by the way, that's not old. There's a lot of ladies in their late 50s and 60s that are inspiring. They're active. They've got great social lives. They're intelligent. Yeah. They still work. And, and they're young at heart, probably because they're, they're, they're taking care of their health and fitness. You know, mm. they're not just sitting on the recliner changing the channel. So yeah, um, I love that. That's great. But my point is, those people they can afford it. Yeah. You know, yes. whenever we get a twenty-year-old uni student, you know, no disrespect, three months, bang, exams come, they lose their job yeah. at Boost Juice. Yeah. They they cancel. Yeah. So you know, there's no point trying to push it um, beyond the target market. Ironically, when I look at our social media analytics, most people looking at it are you know in the twenty-two to twenty-eight group, <laughs> but um, they don't want to join up. Well, they don't join up as as much. I think sixty bucks a week is more of a hit to them. Yeah. In saying that. With a lot of twenty-four-year-old girls spending seventy-nine bucks a week on a gym membership. Yeah, for sure. But, um, yeah. Now we sort of like the people that, that they, they don't want to get worked too hard. Mind you, Pilates. It's not. It's that it's easy. It's just mm-hmm. low impact. And yeah. there's a saying too: yes. that Pilates is easy until you do it right. Uh, so, um, yeah. but you know, we have a strong culture of you know instructors. We have a instructor certification school, mm-hmm. and, and they go through that, which is a huge part of our IP and you know systems. Fantastic. Um, and it's. It, it, it is about how to teach the class, but it's also about our standards and our values and mm-hmm. our culture. You know, I'm fascinated with culture. If you look at a company like GE or Virgin, like how do they get the culture right, you know, globally? Yeah. Sometimes they don't perhaps, but, you know, like yeah. it's not just, you know, you've got a small business. Okay, good, good culture. Can you think about the best teams you've been in or, the, you know, the best organisations and what are the common themes, you know? Mm-hmm. So um, that's probably the, the members that we look for. We get the, all, most of the guys that come to us are partners of members. Yes, okay. Um, yeah. Franchise owners, studio owners, like, you know, you can see why in franchising it's hard. There's a lady who inquired recently about a franchise and I just knew she was the wrong person. But, you know, when, when there's money involved, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to say no, but I did, you know, because yeah. I just can sense the alarm bell so people who are you know they say franchising is not for you if you want to paint the walls a different color and Mm -hmm. you want to just in this case if you want to start doing your own classes yeah so if you want but you know one of my favorite books is drive by daniel pink yes he identifies the three things that make people most engaged in the Mm -hmm. workplace and those three things according to him were autonomy mastery and purpose and you know in a structured system or a franchise system, maybe there's a, a lack of autonomy, but we have a framework and within that framework there's a degree of flexibility. Okay. Um, mastery, you know, the, the, the never-ending pursuit of getting better at your craft yeah. and, 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 and purpose. What better purpose is there than in, in improving people's health and fitness? Mm. My purpose is making people business owners yeah. and there's a saying that business is a vehicle to have the life you want yeah. so it's not just working for work's sake it's what do you want out of your life and how can work facilitate that you know yeah. how can you get this place to run without you or you want to work there two three four days a week yeah. you know one of our most recent studios we've, and we've got two multiple franchisees already and one of our most recent studios the lady who had been grinding away teaching pilates for 30 years she's now working there you know four shifts a week and when I say shift I'm talking about a block of classes in the morning or a block of classes in the night mm-hmm. two or three classes so she's not working much at all and she's getting fully paid for her her time managing the studio and teaching classes so yeah. that's pretty cool the studio is only four and a half months old as well so d- does someone need to is, are there any requirements of experience in the industry or, um, well it's a good question yeah. you know you probably know yourself a lot of small businesses can be best owner operated like mm-hmm. will an investor come one day and open five and put a manager in each one of them you know yeah. maybe but I do like the idea of owner operators and you know KFC have a model where 
you've got to work in one to open one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's cool as well. Yeah. But I mean, gosh, as a franchise owner, you must be uh, a franchisor. You've got to be pretty patient, hey. You know? yeah. and, but you can see why it's the best way because with our current instructors who open studios, yes. oh, they get the culture. Yeah. And they understand the standards and they understand just everything without having to sit there and read it in a book or watch it on an online video program. Mm-hmm. So we do get inquiries from all over the country, but they're much harder to sort of you know get on board. People from WA and Brisbane saying you know that they say how much does it cost? It's it's, it's, it's the wrong first question. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah. So, yeah. Much can I make? Uh, so, um, but you know, like, um, you know, how do I know if someone's going to be amazing or, or not, not amazing? But you know, when I was a franchise owner and you were too, you, mm-hmm. it's your business. Yeah. Like a lot of people think franchising, like the franchise, or is going to grow the business for them. But it's it's your business. Yeah. It's, it's your money and. And, um, and, you know, our franchise fee, the, the monthly fee works out to be worth 11 members a week, you know. So, mm-hmm. you know, if, when I say 150 members, that, that's pretty much the minimum as well. Mind yeah. you, it works on 100. Yes. Once you get up to 180, 200, it's pretty exciting. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. So I was probably just to cap off that question, but, you know, it sounds pretty generic, but if you're going to come on board, you, you've got to have a good attitude. You've got to have an open mind. You've got to have the, you know, not, the, what's the word? Willingness to learn. You don't know everything. Even if you know everything, like, you know so much, but you read a book every day. Yeah. Like you, you can never know. I mean, probably the more you learn, much. the more you realize you don't know. Absolutely. <laughs> so if I think about my business journey, and it's been a couple of decades for me as well, one of my first was getting involved in, in franchising. And although I'm no longer in franchising, I see the massive benefit in what franchises did offer me, despite their failings at times um, and so much of it was was around systems but there's systems in in the daily operations of the business but it's more than that it's like a, I remember in the in the coffee business it was the site selection the fit out um, the, the training of the team there are so many um, moving parts in operating any business and a franchise will often enable you to not just avoid the trial and error and the, pit, the pitfalls um, but Essentially, you've got a user manual for operating a successful business. So, tell me about like you've you've had as much as experience that I've had um, in franchise systems and, and outside of them. So, tell me what you've how you've designed this to make sure that it's a seamless turnkey operation for a, an operator. Yeah, there's a lot of ways to look at it. I mean, a lot of people are thinking about opening one of these franchises. Are- it's a bit like the e-myth you touched on before. Um, Michelle makes the pies. She's great at making pies. She mm-hmm. thinks she'd go and open, open her own business mm-hmm. making pies. Now, but I, I suppose to bring it back to here, we're talking about mostly Pilates instructors. Yeah. But how can they do what they love with minimal headaches? Now, yeah. making the transition from potentially an instructor to a, a, an owner, it's going to come with some growth and challenges, but that's all part of it. And it's got to be viewed mm-hmm. as a good thing. Yeah. But I mean, you know, I mean, what's involved in a successful business? I mean, having an element of innovation, how do we do that? And, and, and we've done that. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I probably won't go into too much depth, but it's not reinventing the wheel. It's just doing some things a little bit differently. So you're perceived as being a lot different. Yeah. You know, unique selling points and how unique are they? But they're just little bits of innovation, you know, we've got a set of core values and one of our big values is is actually value you know like a lot of people are used to paying thirty dollars for a pilates class that in life they can do seven classes a week for 59 bucks why yeah. would they go anywhere so yeah. i like to give the members every reason to try you the trial mm-hmm. every reason to to come on board every reason to stay and no reason to go anywhere else you know like what why would i dare them to get better value somewhere else yeah um you know all the other elements like the facility you know what's involved in facility remember those questions we used to ask like i know now what members don't care about and mm-hmm. i know what they do care about so in the past i've wasted a lot of money on things that makes no difference yes. it doesn't get you any more customers yeah. it doesn't keep the current customers for longer um so you just don't need to do it and i see uh, i see things now in other businesses and i'm like oh geez that must have cost a lot that didn't that didn't work mm-hmm. you know the recruitment and the team the team's everything i mean yeah. the team is everything i always say people they come for the brand and they stay for the people which mm-hmm. is why the onus is on me and the owners to keep the people yeah what keeps the people what do team members want you know yeah. they want to feel valued and appreciated and they want to work in a great place um they want to uh i was just trying to think the q12 remember that yeah um they, they want to be paid fairly and on time they want opportunities for growth and development they mm-hmm. want to be part of something and feel like they're going somewhere so yeah. we can do all that yeah. no worries um you know member retention you do the maths on member losses you know mm-hmm. a member you know pays 59 bucks a week it's three grand a year you lose two you lose two a week that's six, six grand a year mm-hmm. you, but the, the way it's two a week, 
every week. If you lose two a week, every week. Yeah. That's that's 50 weeks, you know, 50 it, times it six. Compounds. You know, yes. It compounds. Yeah. It's like, you know, that's 300 grand a year. Yeah. Well, you know what I should have done? I should have just paid those guys a little bit more so they stay because <laughs> they kept their members. Yeah. And then I should have put a bit more money into like, we've got a thing called a member gratitude calendar where they'll get every quarter a water bottle or a towel mm. or a card in the mail, you know, or a massage. And and, and then they, they, they tell people they feel like they're not invisible. Yeah. You know, um, you know, you know. It's a, just some of the stuff that you're talking about, if, um, and over the years, I've done consulting and coaching and so many times a business owner will come to me, even in the, the current industry that I'm in, and they'll say, well, how much rent should I be paying for the salon spa or clinic that I want to open? And it's the answer to those questions, which so many new business operators, they go in so blind, they they have to ask those questions of how much rent should I be paying? Well, that's already answered. Um, you just don't, no one would be permitted to open a studio if the rent was not part of the model. Yeah, exa exactly. You know, that's the beauty called, of the model, isn't it? It's called the studio location criteria. Yeah. There's 14 points on it. Um, ideally, they'll all be met, mm -hmm. but sometimes one's not met. Like yeah. um, it might not have great parking yeah. or it might not have much natural light. Um, and it's just, you know, I was going to say again, it's a bit like a girlfriend. Like you might not meet all your criteria, but, you know, how many are prepared to live without? Yeah. You know, so but, yeah. but, but it, it's, it's feasible to meet all the criteria. Mm -hmm. But I'll just rattle off another bunch of things that, you know, are relevant with studio either setup or operation. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. um, the costs, how easy is to operate, systems that are proven, a level of accountability. Who are you accountable to as a business owner? Like mm -hmm. no one really. So you've yeah. got to have a get, I want people to feel accountable to, to someone or at least have some support. Loads of support. Standard, yeah, support. Um, leadership's a big thing that no one ever teaches you. You know, mm -hmm. you're going to be a leader as an owner. The branding, what does branding mean? How is building a brand different to building a business? It's different, you know. Mm -hmm. Like, look at Coke and Apple. God love them. They can spend $100 million on an ad that doesn't actually promote anything. It's just <laughs> lifestyle, you know. <laughs> like, like fit people jumping on a trampoline. Um, you know, culture, personal development. No, a business will never outgrow the level of personal development of its leader. That's so true. Um, admin and bookkeeping. You know, when you open a business, you never think a bookkeeper is going to be a vital function. So it is. What does a bookkeeper do? Um, how much does it cost to open? What What happens when we break down that cost? How can we make it more accessible? How do you negotiate? Well, how do you find a commercial premises and negotiate a lease? Mm -hmm. Do people know that you can get a rent-free period at the beginning? Mm -hmm. you know? um, what legal requirements are involved? How do I set up a company? What's my best company structure? You know, talk to your accountant. Um, we have a website which communicates with our CRM, you know, the back end system, mm -hmm. which communicates with our app. You know, all this stuff is done. GST registration, tax file number, social media, sourcing the equipment. There's a lot of power with being with a the network. There's certain levels of insurance that you require. How do you do your pre opening sales and marketing? How do you not just sell a workout but create an experience? When I open for the first time, should I do an offer like we did at? Tribe, uh, foundation memberships are a bit cheaper, mm -hmm. or do we do a trial yeah. where we put the responsibility back on ourselves to convert these people to members? Are you financially literate? You know, how should you structure your timetable? Is the timetable a form of marketing? Is it appealing to the current members and the people that are looking at the timetable and thinking, I won't join there? Um, how do you show your members that you value them? How do you do 36 month financial projections? Yeah. yeah. Um, how, do you build, how do you build an asset that's worth something? You know, yeah, that, that's saleable. Um, how do you build an asset? How do you build a business that works without you? Yeah, you know, it can be done. Like you can be making money and yeah. seriously not going to work that much. How do you motivate your key people? Who's in your internal team? Yep, who's on your external team? Go for it. And uh, finally, you know, just want to give people a huge level of support. But you know, we do have the proven systems for sales, member retention, member results, customer service, the timetable. The classes that we offer, and yeah, it's like I said before, it's not just the line that we say, you know, oh, all this stuff works. It has been developed over many years, and I'm really proud of it. I just really believe in it, you know. Yeah. So I believe in the business model, and just want to get the right people on board to also believe in it to take it to the next level. Yeah, I love it. Um, we did touch on this, and 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 I wanted to just take a little bit of a deeper dive because one of the things that in any business you get all of that right, and then so so often the concern is how do I actually attract more customers? How do I actually ensure that I've got enough people coming through the door? And you talked about the numbers required, um, but I want to I want to explain to anyone watching that 
two of the most important numbers in all of marketing and all of growth in a business is how much does it cost you to attract a new customer and then what is the lifetime value of that customer mm. and if you get those two numbers right where you keep the cost of acquiring a new com- customer low but you keep the lifetime value of that customer high by keeping them with you for an extended period of time mm. um, that formula alone um, can make or break a business mm. but you've paid particular attention to that with the marketing plan, the promotions to start, um, getting someone to break even quickly, ensuring that even those trial um, uh, periods for people uh, are paid trials so that you keep the acquisition cost really low and then putting a strong focus on retention so that that lifetime value just extends forever and ever, ideally. Um, But firstly, I think that that's one of the shining lights to in life on what you've created along with everything else. But tell me more about how you created that because that's not an easy um, thing to develop for any business. You're referring back to the acquisition cost and the lifetime value? Yeah. Well, I suppose we all know that it's easier to retain a current customer than to get a new one. Our one-week trial process, it is laborious. Mm. You know, um, it's much easier to not do it. Yeah. But it increases the conversion of that member to full customer by about 900%. Wow. So okay. why not do it? You know, besides, it. you know, if you love what you do, it's more fulfilling and it's the yeah. right thing to do. So um, I suppose just after, you know, years of like, it, you know, years of signing up people, keeping people, losing people, mm-hmm. like 20 years of that, like yeah. you understand what members want and what yeah. they need to feel, like I say, I keep coming back to valued and appreciated mm. and um, also what engages them in terms of um, the what you offer in the price that you charge. You know, you mentioned before, you know, what if I'd never lost a customer? What if you'd, um, what if you never lost a customer but the price was 20% cheaper? Now, there's, there's going to be some other implications with that sort of scenario. But, you know, we're $59 a week. You know, a few years ago, it was 49 You know, mm-hmm. it, it, there was a significant difference with how many people signed up and stayed. Yeah. I, I know I could push it to 69 but I know that as soon as a couple of people come once or twice a week, they're going to question the value. Mm-hmm. You know, so for, for every person that comes seven bucks a week, seven times a week on 59 yeah. where I start thinking, oh, gee, they've got a good deal, yeah. um, there's someone else that comes twice a week. Yeah. You know, so it's all offset. And yeah. the business just just works so it's fine so yeah but yeah i I do like explaining why it is the way it is and because i feel like then people will have a greater appreciation yeah but um just also rest assured that it is the way it is for a reason yeah Yeah. love it great thanks mate thanks for being here today